Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, what a great event. Oh, my gosh. The organizers of this thing, they've been planning forever. They've been a little nervous, and it all seems to be totally coming off. It looks magnificent outside and inside. So let's get you back outside. And I'm the pre-lunch speaker, right? No pressure. Nutrition. <laughs> pre-lunch speaker. All right. So what I picked for today was a range of topics. I have too many slides. If I don't get through them all, that's fine. Kind of what I want to do is do proteins and carbs, a sort of traditional nutrition topics that I think are confusing. Then really quickly, I want to do some organic and some GMO, because I answer that kind of question also. And then I want to end up with uh, an overall plug for how do you motivate yourself to do this, and a plug for a program we have called the Well Registry. And wherever I am at 12, I'm going to stop for 15 minutes of questions. If you really want to interrupt me in the middle because I said something crazy, you can try. But let me see if I can get through these first. Ready? OK, this one is driving me nuts. And I have a little uh, bias here. So I've been a vegetarian since 1983, back when Tiffany dumped me. And she was a vegetarian. I tried to be a vegetarian to get her back. And I still am a vegetarian. I, she never took me back, but I'm fine. <laughs> It, it all worked out OK. But man, am I sick and tired of people asking me where the heck I get my protein. It drives me nuts. So these are some data from the Food and Agricultural Organization. This is how much meat countries eat around the world. Uh, on the y-axis is how much meat they eat. And on the x-axis, how much money they make. And as they make more and more money for a GDP, or this thing they call the PPP, which is adjusted for something, you can see that, yeah, as people get more money, they have more access, they get more meat. And the, the really obscene thing is the outlier there. I mean, at one point, there's a plateau. And people say, OK, enough meat is enough, except for us. We seem to be, you know, go USA. Let's just, <laughs> come on, guys, really? OK, then not, here's another way to represent the same data. These are global data split into animal and plant protein. And if you go to the left, you see that an enormous part of the world, like Asia and India, get mostly plant protein. And you've heard of the vast, horrific, horrific protein deficiency symptoms with people falling down in the streets all over India and China. You haven't heard of that? They don't fall down in the streets. They're fine. Gosh. OK, and then look who wins the prize on the right. Yay! Go, USA! More protein. Why are we obsessed? And as if the meat isn't enough, good God. <laughs> Come on, really? Now, I know you guys don't have these at home, but do any of you know some one of your friends who has one of these products at home, right? You are, not you guys, but you know people who have those. <laughs> Holy cow. And then this is the scariest thing I have ever seen, protein water. We've got vitamin water. We've got mineral water. The one in the bottom has 42 grams of protein in the freaking water. It's driving me. The top one on the right is like a sugar delivery system with protein in it. Why? OK, so 60 years ago, they figured out how much protein we needed. They figured it out so long ago. People don't remember because it's boring. They found that everybody has this normal distribution. Some of you in the room need the most. Some need the least. In the middle are most of you, the average, and that's called the estimated average requirement. And I'll bet you a lot of you have heard of the recommended daily allowance, which is not the average requirement. It's a population health approach to nutrition. And a normal distribution curve, you go two standard deviations above the average. That way, if everybody were to get that, you'd have the safety buffer. So you're really covering everybody. You're covering 97.5% of the population right there. Got that concept? This is the estimated average requirement. I threw up a couple weights. So extrapolate a little, find your weight. I see a lot of people in between like 125 and 175 pounds in the room. So that's like 40 to 50 grams. The recommended daily allowance has a buffer, and it's more like 50 to 60 grams. The average American eats twice the average requirement or the RDA without even trying. And then they buy the protein powder. And then they buy the protein bar. And then they buy the protein cereal. And then they buy, oh my god, what is going on here? So quick nutrition science uh, metabolism thing. So 
So most of your protein is functional. It's in your hair, it's in your fingernails, enzymes, hormones, skeletal muscle, things like that. So if you've eaten too much protein, and you do, not intentionally, and it's not necessarily all that bad, what happens with the extra protein that's above your requirement? Do you have any idea? Do you think there's a place to store it for the next day? So wait, let's go back. Is there any place in your body to store fat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, yeah, you can store fat anywhere and everywhere. Sorry, we have unlimited capacity. Do you know how much carbohydrate you store and where? It's much more specific. You only store carbohydrate in your liver and your muscles for when you need it next. And not very much either, because actually carbohydrate is associated with water. Every time you store the carbohydrate, you also store water, and it makes you heavy. So um, you basically have enough carbohydrate to last for about a marathon, and then it would all be gone. Okay? You'd use up all your carbohydrate storage. So how much protein do you store and where? Any, any offers from the audience today? Any clue? Yes, where do you think? Yeah, so that's not storage, though. She said you eliminate it in your urine. There isn't any. There's no place to store protein. So when you've eaten too much, you actually break it down into carbohydrate and fat. So it doesn't really matter if you eat too much protein or too much carb or too much fat. In the end, they all kind of interconvert. Now, the one thing about protein is when you turn that into carb or fat, it's the only thing that has nitrogen in it. And you have to take the nitrogen off to use the carbon skeleton. And you have to turn the nitrogen into ammonia in your liver and eliminate it in your kidney. And I've asked a bunch of nephrologists, isn't that bad? Doesn't that hurt to be peeing out all that ammonia? And then nephrologists have said, not really. They haven't really connected it to anything deleterious. We can say that if you have impaired kidney function, you should cut back on your protein intake, especially your excess protein intake. But I don't really have a compelling reason to say that that double the RDA that a lot of you are already getting is bad for you. There's just no reason for it, OK? So I just wanted to put that in context and bring this up. So every five years, we redo the dietary guidelines, and we have a, an elected, selected dietary guidelines advisory committee who this last time raised a lot of political stink saying, you know, we really got to eat less animal products and more plant products, partly to save the planet. And people were really outraged. And we never actually got to put that into the dietary guidelines. But a bunch of other people said, oh my god, but if I switched away from animals to plants, where would I get my protein? <laughs> OK, so I have an answer to that. All right, and I have an audience poll question with these four options. Do plants not have protein? I already gave that one away. They do. OK, so the next three. Are all plant foods missing some of the essential amino acids? Do some plant foods, are, are they missing some? Or do all plant foods have all 20 amino acids, essential and non-essential? You get 30 seconds. No, you get five. Five, four, three, two, one. Who votes for number one? You can't because I just told everybody it was wrong. Who votes for number two? Yeah. Who votes for number three? Who votes for number four? four. The fours have it. Here we go. So this is a distribution of the amino acids in an egg. And just for reference sake, I'm going to pick a total of 40 grams. Because remember, I just told you the estimated average requirement is, a, is around 40. And I like that number because there's 20 amino acids. So some of you might have thought, if you ever think about this kind of thing, that there's 20 amino acids and you need 40, so you must need two of each one. But that's, that's not true. Who plays Scrabble here? Anybody never played Scrabble? How about never played Scrabble? <laughs> How many Zs are there? How many Qs? How many Js? How many Es? How many Ns? How many Rs? OK? Amino acids are like Scrabble letters. Some get used a lot more often than others. And this is the example. This is the distribution of amino acids per gram if you were to get 40 grams. And chicken, salmon, uh, beef, pork, they, they all look the same. OK, and it, not that it matters a whole lot, but I put the essential ones in blue and the non-essentials in gray. And I don't want to get into too many details because you can ask me questions later. But for all the smart people in the room, who knows which one of these is which? You know, Which one's missing some of the amino acids? This is pretty picky. I don't really expect anybody to know this. But look, and I want you to think about it for a minute so I can get another drink of water. <laughs> OK, you picked your favorite. Which one do you think is which? It's a trick question now. 
That's rice, that's black bean, that's peanut, and that's broccoli. I asked this question at a dietetics conference, 500 young dietetics and four senior dietitians in the front row. The, five, the 496 young dietitians picked answers two and three, and only the four senior dietitians picked the right answer. All plants have all 20 amino acids. Get off my back. That's where I get <laughs> my protein. It's all there. So wait, isn't there something about quality? There is something, but it's just not as big a deal as you might think. The proportion is what's key, and it's true grains have a smaller proportion than optimal of lysine, and beans have a smaller proportion of methionine than is optimal, but it's not missing. So how would you get enough? Just eat more food, and you do. You guys eat a lot of food. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so if all I got was edamame for the day, I could get 40 grams of protein in two cups. That's, that's not all I ever eat every day. That would only be 500 calories. I'd never survive. How about broccoli? Uh, 10 cups. I've never eaten 10 cups in one sitting, and it's a lot easier if you steam it than you give me that darn raw broccoli fluoret. Oh, Dr. Gardner, we knew you were coming, and we knew you were a vegetarian, so we got you the raw veggie platter and the ranch dressing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really? You've got no culinary talent in the back whatsoever. Thank you for the raw broccoli florets. Okay, I'm not eating 10 cups of raw broccoli florets. How about 600 calories of black beans? Two and a half cups. That would be 40 right there. Now, actually, none of those 40s would work because they're not perfectly proportioned. You would have to get more than 40 grams of plant protein to meet your 40 grams of need because you wouldn't quite be getting enough lysine and methionine. But... I'm going to eat another 1,500 or 2,000 calories, and I'm going to get more amino acids from everything else, too. So I'm really not worried. So I'm going to make it even more specific. I'm going to give you some examples. This is, tell me, look at it for a minute, see if you think you agree. Do you think this looks like the standard American diet, which as an acronym, we summarize as the SAD diet? <laughs> That's not really all that crazy, right? And that's 2,500 calories. I very much picked that. I don't want to get into an argument right now, but when you all self-report how much you eat, you under-report a lot. The average woman in the US eats about 2,500 calories a day, even though you don't think you do. And the average guy eats about 3,000 calories a day. We can have that debate later if you want. I just picked 2,500 calories for an example. Scale it up or down if you want. How do those proportions look? How do those selections look? How many grams of protein do you think that is? Remember, the estimated average requirement is about 40. The RDA is about 60. 125 grams of protein. And according to the USDA, it's about 85% animal and 15% plant. And that's about what Americans eat when they eat the sad American diet. Sorry, the standard American diet. OK, so this is what it would look like. If you needed 40 grams of protein, I got the essential amino acids on the left, non-essential on the right. I got all the proportions you would need to meet your requirements for your hair, your enzymes, your hormones, your skeletal to muscle, whatever. So that means anything you eat in excess, like 125 grams, everything in red would be converted to carbohydrate and fat. There's no place to store it. It's functional or not, OK? And you can see if the, some of those little three-letter names there, some of them you don't break down a lot because you never got a lot. OK, now do this for me. Pretend that you don't need 40. You need 60. You need 50% more than I said. Can you take all those white bars and make them 50% taller and still be covered in the red? Yeah, easily, right? OK, so even if my 40 is an underestimate, you are totally covered. All right. So there's the 85 you break down. So let's try something else. I'm going to modify the SAD diet. And I'm not saying this is what I'm super happy with. But you'll see in a minute, I made some OK change. Look at the hummus and crackers for a snack, and the apple and peanut butter for a snack. And oh my god, I got a salad for lunch. You can see I took out some of the animal products and some of the meat. How, mu how much protein do you think I have now? What do you think? I manipulated it. I made it 124 again, 125. <laughs> but what I very intentionally did is I made it half animal and half plant. So I, it was a shift. 
record more plant protein. Oh my God, what are you going to do? You're going to fall over. If you're going to eat that many plants, you're not going to get enough protein, right? Don't panic. That's what it looks like. Doesn't it look almost identical to the last one? But isn't that because the distribution of amino acids in plants is almost identical to animal? They're not missing. It's just lysine and methionine are a little low. All right, so again, I'm going to have to break down a whole bunch and convert it to carbohydrate and fat. OK, but this is what I'd like. I'd love for Americans to just think like this for a minute. So this is my enlightened protein shift. Look at that veggie omelet with some almonds for a, almonds for a snack. I got a chicken salad. I got a, oh my god, I got a vegan dinner. I got a tofu veggie stir fry with brown rice and sparkling water. I got chocolate in there, and I got some berries. How many grams of protein do you think that is after horrifically removing all those animal products from your diet? God, it must be like 10 or 90, something like that. OK, so if your requirement's 40, that's 90. OK, and I made it very intentionally half animal and half plant. It's kind of what I'd like to see happen in the US these days. And what would that look like? So now what you're breaking down and converting to carbs and fats is the green bar. So maybe I underestimated. Maybe the white isn't what you need. You need 60, not 40. Make any of the white bars 50% higher. Am I short on anything yet? No, no way. All right, so I still got to break down 50 and turn it to carbs and fats. Here's one of my vegan days. This is 2,500 calories. What do you think? Not bad. Oh, total deprivation. Oh, it looks like I'm eating cardboard. Ooh, how do I do it? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> anyway, so I love having oatmeal with walnuts and mango for breakfast. Uh, the Nexus Cafe here at the Clark Center that we're next to, that run by Guggenheimer, has this amazing salad bar. And Gypsy Soup, which is one of my favorite recipes from Molly Katzen. I just throw a couple uh, cashews on that. And that is one of my favorite dinners. It's so favorite that my family almost rebels. Oh my god, Gypsy Soup again? <laughs> um, but I really like Gypsy Soup. How many grams of protein? There's no meat or dairy in there whatsoever. Oh my god, there must not be any protein at all. Except there is. There's 78 grams of protein. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> I'll be around all week. You can talk to me afterwards. So what does that look like? Well, if the white bars are my requirement, uh, I'd be breaking down everything in green. Now, do I have room to make those white bars a lot bigger? N not really. In fact, I might not get enough methionine or cysteine if my requirement is higher. But uh, it's, that's the vegan diet. And there's really probably not many vegans out there. So if you're vegan, you have to be a little smarter about it. But it's really not that bad. It's not hard. OK, so that was my fun. And then I, I took this out of a textbook. I'll let you read it on your own. Read the white part really fast. Then get to the yellow part. Because in America, when you have an abundance of food, and you're not eating crap all day, as long as you eat an abundance of decent food, it would be almost impossible not to get your protein requirement, even without meat, fish, or poultry, or eggs, or cheese, or soy. In a nutrition dietetics textbook, it's just really not that hard. People, will you please stop obsessing about protein? And if it's not you, will you please tell your friends, because they're driving me nuts. All right. <laughs> All right, that was the first topic. You can ask me more later. That is the longest one. All the other ones are shorter. So carbohydrate phobia, um, how evil are these things anyway? So I'm just going to tell you what I think is a, an important take home message. I do a lot of studies with different diet patterns. And I've held some debates among some of the fans of the extremely different diets. And it was pretty fun getting them all to agree on a couple things. Yes, added sugars are about the worst thing we do in the US. Not sugar, added sugars. So fruits have sugars, vegetables have sugars, there's natural sugars. It's all the honey and molasses and high fructose corn syrup and agave and all the stuff we're adding. That's probably the problem. So everybody's down on those, whether you're a low fat, a paleo, a Mediterranean. All those folks are down on added sugars. How about the amazing amount of white wheat flour? How many of you were just in Justin Sonnenberg's talk? This room was full a minute ago. So remember he was talking about the kinds of grains we're eating? So I, I was just looking at some USDA data. Americans eat 120 pounds of grains a year. About 90% of it is wheat. 
and about 90% of that is white flour. So one of the issues about non-celiac gluten sensitivity is, uh, I, I think it's this. It's just that we're eating way too much refined white flour. Pizza crust, bagels, breads, pastries, cookies, chips, uh, wheat tortillas, right? So everybody's down on the white wheat flour. Both of those are carbs, added flours, uh, sorry, added sugars, and white flour, huge source of calories in our diet. That's all carb. I would be all down for getting rid of those, but veggies, veggies are all carbs, so don't get too down on carbs. Everybody's for veggies. More, more, more veggies. And hug a chef, because a chef will help you find fabulous ways to simplistically cook these, and they'll be fabulous, not like the uh, raw broccoli florets. Actually, we have a physician who's a, a chef, and one of her favorite recipes is say, take a whole head of cauliflower, bust off the florets, drizzle some olive oil, a little pinch of salt, put it in the oven for about 15 minutes, take it out, you're done. Ah, that's it. Everybody write that down? Okay. Oh my gosh, it tastes so great. It's just cauliflower with a little olive oil and roasting. Okay, so I hope some of you are familiar with myplate.gov that re replaced the pyramid. So I, I have, there's pros and cons to it, but, but let's do this just for a minute. Here's some actual examples of foods that would go in the categories of my plate, even the dairy, which is a little circle at the, off the side of the plate. So really, veggies are mostly carbs. Fruits are mostly carbs. Dairy is a lot of carbs. Grains are mostly carbs. Beans and peas, which are part of the protein group, are mostly carbs. So if you're anti-carb, what the heck is left to eat? <laughs> Meat and fat, that's it. And so it's driving me crazy when these anti-carb folks are saying, no, no, we really got to be ketogenic. Well, you, if you are, wow, you're going to have to wipe out a lot of really tasty food and fun and pleasure. So <sighs> this is my own personal carbohydrate pyramid. Start at the bottom. The bottom is best. Have lots of legumes. Have lots of the non-starchy veggies. As you work your way up, whole grains are fine. How about steel-cut oats or wheat berry salad? Not even whole wheat bread. Wheat berry salad, uh, whole fruits, and then maybe after that, some pasta and brown rice. After that, some whole grain bread, some whole grain bagels, some whole grain pizza crust, but really not a lot of those. And then the top is where a lot of American calories are, white bread, soda, that's what they're eating, and that's what I want you to avoid or limit. So anyway, I'll, I'm going to keep working on my carbohydrate pyramid there. Uh, it's not available anywhere except to you, because you came today, and I guess you all get access to slides. Are they going to make the slides available to attendees? Yeah. So you can all have my slides when I'm done. So uh, I hope I get other questions, too. So there's a lot of complicated questions about carbs and fueling and glycogen loading and things like that, so I'll be happy to do that afterward. But I do want to put protein and carb together and give, out a, give a shout out to Justin, who's been doing fabulous work with the microbiome, one of my favorite new partners on this campus. And I know he gave a plug for his book, which seemed shameless, but I'll do it for him. And then it's less shameless if I plug his book for him, right? <laughs> OK. So this is what's driving me crazy. If America is on this obsession of having fewer and fewer carbs and more and more protein, what that means is less and less fiber. So if you were here for his talk, fiber is a big deal and diverse sources of fiber. And so let me put some numbers there in, in context. Y'all are getting about twice as much protein as the RDA says you need. And on top of that, you're having protein water and protein shakes and protein powders. Um, here's a national recommendation for dietary fiber. And Americans get about half the recommendation for fiber. So if there's anything you should be more concerned about to meet dietary guidelines, it's fiber, not protein. And to put it in perspective, um, this is the Hadza that Justin may have talked about um, that he studied. Uh, if you're going to whine about 40 or 50 grams of fiber, the Hadza eat 150 grams of fiber a day. Now, I'm not sure if I'm down for 150 a day. They, they're hunting and gathering all day, and they're chewing some pretty gnarly stuff all day. But <laughs> it is possible. So the 30 or 40 is really not out of whack if you look at some cultures around the world. So shout out for more fiber, which means probably in the US diet, less protein, more carbs, as long as you're picking the healthier whole food sources of carbs that I was trying to refer to. So go, Justin and his wife, Erica, a great book. All right, 
Now, I thought I'd go off and talk about a different kind of topic to see if you'd like me to answer questions about those. How many of you remember voting, yes or no, I'm not going to ask you which way you voted, for GMO labeling five years ago? I voted for GMO labeling one way or the other. Do you remember what the verdict was? It was wildly popular several months before the vote. And then it got defeated. I don't know if you were disappointed, if you were happy, whatever. It was super politically contentious, even though it was just like, can't we just put a label on the, f we're not restricting anything, it's just a label. Well, turns out, uh, it's re when you were voting, what were you using as the basis for your vote? So let's get at some of the subtle nuances there. So for this whole GMO food thing, it seems like the common perception is this bizarre Frankenfood thing that we should just get off the shelves because it's horrific. And so part of the hard time in figuring out what to vote for was some of the different issues that got raised. And I don't even think all the relevant issues got raised. So let's go through a couple of them. How many of you think the reason for doing GMO is to insert something in a food that will make it more nutritious? Doesn't come to mind? So right here, this is uh, golden rice that they grew in the Philippines. They have a vitamin A deficiency. You can meet your deficiency by um, replacing it with beta carotene, which gets converted to vitamin A. And to do that, the rice actually looks golden because the beta carotene takes on some color. So this was a nutritional modification that was intended to address a deficiency. That's probably not what most of you think of for GMO, right? If I told you that was one of the possibilities of GMO, would you be a little more open-minded? OK. All right, so oh my god, look at this plane spraying these plants with ready Roundup. Oh my gosh, Monsanto, oh. All right, but really the idea was the rationale for using ready Roundup was that you'd only have to spray once with less and not go back and back and back again with a complicated mixture, and that what you'd actually get in the long run is maybe not more pesticide on the food you eat, but less farm worker exposure. That's a pretty relevant issue. We don't, I don't think that comes to mind for most people. How much pesticide exposure are the farm workers getting that cultivate all our food and pick it for us? How about the runoff? So when they put too many pesticides on our crops and it runs off into our rivers and streams, that's not so good. Um, the thing you probably thought about is how much pesticide you get exposed to. And so I'm referencing here the environmental working groups Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. So they tell you the foods that most likely have the most pesticides on them. But really, it's a, it's a tough argument. So the government has come up with sort of minimum levels below which it shouldn't hurt you. And it's hard to really prove that it doesn't hurt you. You'd have to do a test. Everybody here eat enough that it would hurt you. And everybody here don't. And let's see if it works. You ready to sign up? No, nobody wants to sign up for that. So they do a bunch of different ways and they figure out a reasonable amount of intake. And really, the amount that they're putting on is reasonable according to those guidelines. And in theory, Ready Roundup was even lowering those levels because then there would be fewer other pesticides that you had to put on. So that's the pesticide thing is very uh, confusing. So is the yield. So I wonder how many of you thought the reason we were genetically modifying them is we've got 7 billion now. We're going to have 10 billion soon. Oh my god, we've only got one planet. We better grow more food on the same planet. Maybe we can increase the yield. Is that what you were thinking? Were you thinking it was a yield issue? Well, it turns out that there's one group that says, yes, we have totally increased the yield. And there's the American Union of Concerned Scientists that if you look at the data, the yield has not gone up at all. So uh, I'm not sure if that's an issue we've resolved yet. But it should be one that you consider, because it is one of the pros and cons of whether GMOs are worth it. Another one that I thought was really interesting was this uh, op-ed in the New York Times. Somebody who was really totally anti-GMO in the US until they learned in Bangladesh there was this plague that was attacking the eggplant, which was a staple for them. And the GMO was designed to counter the bug that was killing off the eggplant. So this is saving a staple crop that was at risk of being destroyed. I thought that was way more relevant than more corn and more soy in the US, which is about one of the few things we use it for in the US. If you haven't had genetic, genetically modified carrots or tomatoes lately, we don't do that. You don't grow enough to make it worthwhile to invest in it. It's been soy and corn and wheat, 
and uh, a little canola oil and cotton on the side. So it really depends on the crop that you're talking about. And then one final issue that you may or may not be aware of is the seed saving issue. So in order to get their money back from the investment they have into these seeds, they make it so that you can't save your seeds and plant them again the next year. You've got to buy them again from Monsanto or somebody else. And if something gets screwed up in your neighbor's crop, blows over to your fields and they grow in your fields, apparently you can get sued for growing patented seeds. And so this is an interview with a farmer who wasn't even trying to grow them, but he got sued by Monsanto. It was in the movie Food, Inc. So a nice overview is in this 2010 uh, National Research Council book. And it's just not a clear story. And it's way more nuanced than most of us thought when we voted five or six years ago. It's not just a Franken food, let's label it. There's really a lot of important issues at play here. And so I think if you're trying to figure out if you're a pro or con for GMO, think, is it for nutrition? Or is it for yield? Or is it for farm worker protection? And is it for farmers themselves? Is it for runoff? So before you make that decision, if you really feel passionate about it, be a little more informed. It isn't that hard to find this information. It's way more complicated than we should label it or not. Okay, so that's one topic I'd love to love for you to think about. Okay, a real quick one is organic. Oh, this is such a sad story. <sighs> <sighs> Seemed like once they figured this out, everybody thought, cool, I will just go to Whole Foods or Safeway and I'll just look for organic and buy it and I'll be fine because it's so confusing when I go in there. Well. Yes, there's these marvelous organic heirloom tomatoes that definitely taste way better than those cardboard things they were sticking in airport salads, right? Uh, and then whole businesses have blossomed around organics. And it's pretty good tasting, good for the environment type stuff. And oh my gosh, farmers markets and, and uh, organic acreage has been going up. Part of that's been really interesting. My wife brought this home for me one day, and she swore she would not feed it to the kids, but she knew I was a nutrition scientist, and she said, I bought this. Um, this isn't healthy, is it? And I said, well, pretty obviously, since the first ingredient is sugar, even though it doesn't say it's sugar, it is, oh, it's not sugar. It's whole, unbleached, unrefined, evaporated, cane juice, something or other. It's sugar, people, come on. A wholesome alternative, traditional snacks? The whole thing is organic, and it is crap. Seriously, look at this. Uh, how many of you would be so proud to go to your physician next week and say, you know what? My diet's really great. I've been eating this organic, low-fat yogurt. Practically warms your heart, doesn't it? Except when you go to your grocery store, how many rows of plain are there, and how many are of pineapple, orange, guava, pineapple, orange, guava? <laughs> OK, well, I'm a huge raspberry fan, so I'm just going to pick raspberry as an example. Shouldn't the raspberry just have one more ingredient than the plain? Shouldn't it be the plain <laughs> and raspberry? <laughs> so something looks wrong here, unless they don't get raspberries that have any flavor or any color or any taste, because apparently they don't, because they've got to add all the other stuff. And so it turns out, even though they're side by side on the shelf, the one on the right is 50% more calories. And a lot of that is not due to the raspberry. It's due to the added sugar. It is a sugar delivery system, ladies and gentlemen, OK? But it's organic. Yes, but it's an organic sugar delivery system. Come on. God, I went to the farmer's market. I got the plane, and I put raspberries on it. It was not that hard. And I, uh, OK, anyway, and I got fiber when I did it. Somehow the one on the right has no fi How do you add raspberries and get no fiber? Not fair. OK, moving on, because i got five more minutes. Karen's going to flash me in one to tell me I have five. You know, this is coming. If you can't see on the side, fair trade, naturally produced health drink, OK? And it's a green can, so it must be good for you. And then organic, I'm loving it. Is it higher nutrient level? Probably not, really, organic versus non-organic. It's not a nutrient thing. It's an environmental thing. Um, are all organic products equally better? N no, you can just meet the minimal guidelines, and it's not that great. And a ton of junk food is getting labeled as organic, and that doesn't work. And the last thing I, I would ask is, if you go to the farmer's market, and I've, I've just cringed when I've seen this, 
I've seen people to go to our Palo Alto local farmer markets, walk up to a new vendor and say, hi, is your produce organic? And in the midst of saying, no, we don't have enough funding to be certified, but we follow all the practices, the patron has already turned their back and walked away looking for an organic farmer. Don't do that, please. Talk to them and find out. A lot of them actually follow all or most of the organic practices, but it is expensive to get certified. And you do have to leave your lands fallow for three years. It's pretty complicated. So talk to your farmers. That's really the best way. Don't be in their face. Okay. Um, last point is this sort of motivation thing. I've had some fun lately telling people what I think is healthy for them, and then they don't do it, and I get really frustrated. And I held a class with a colleague of mine where we decided not to talk about health at all, but we had a health psychologist join us as a teaching assistant. And all we did was read popular books about food, animal rights and welfare, global warming, climate change, farm worker abuse, and we showed cool documentaries that have been getting better and better lately. And we had them write op-eds. There's no quizzes or midterms or exams. They write op-eds and try to get them published. They do YouTubes for behavior change for their peers. They blog. And we actually asked them before and after class what their attitudes were. And we asked three other um, human biology classes what their changes were. And our students changed more than the other ones and reported doing all the things I wanted them to do without ever talking about health. <laughs> and so I have a table, because it's science. And here's a graph and bars. <laughs> and I have p-values with statistical significance. And you should make fun of me, because this is a terrible study. They self-selected in my class. They wrote their names pre and post on the things. And don't you think to get a good grade, said, oh, he might wonder if I change, and if I change, I get a better grade if I said I change. So there's all kinds of reasons to not believe this. But I really think it got published because it's so frustrating getting change that the underlying idea here was that we were going after something other than health. We were going after sort of social external costs of our food choices. And for a lot of our students, that was motivating. And so what I kind of learned was I've been doing talks for 20 years on all these things over here, and people's eyes often glaze over. And now I've been having a lot of fun switching the content. And what I find is people say, oh, because of that, I'm going to try going vegetarian. Oh, I'm really mad about the economics of fast food franchises. I'm not eating fast food anymore. Oh, I didn't know about the global impact. OK, so I'm going to eat less meat, grass-fed meat. They're doing everything I wanted them to without telling them what I wanted them to do. So I've been getting at health in this alternate way. So I, I just want to toss out as another possible motivator for making changes and sticking with them, think how all your food choices affect the society and have these external costs beyond yourself. And for many people, that can be a different source of motivation for making a change and sticking to it, is my plug. So I will just end with saying this kind of thing and more is something that my division at the medical school is very engaged with. We've just started this thing called the Well Registry. Our goal is to get 10,000 citizen scientists to sign up to be Well Registry members and that we'll track you over time and you'll feed us some health information and that as citizen scientists, you'll say, hey, I'm a citizen scientist. I'm really confused about this. Will you guys study that? And we may take some of your ideas and study it with you if you sign up. So there's this cool little thing that I'm too much of an old fart to figure out what to do, but point your phone at it now. <laughs> it actually works. I tried it. It's really cool. You just point your phone at it. It works. And I'll just give you one example of something that we just did. It's up. Go back for this. Oh, you didn't point it enough? OK. I'll go back to it. Let me finish. Karen's only giving me one more minute. See, there it is, the one minute sign. See, I have one minute till 12. I'll go back. OK, maybe you got it now. Uh, three, two, one. I'll show you later, I promise. OK, so one really fun thing we just initiated, and a bunch of people are doing this, is an added sugar detox. You sign up, and for a week, you try to get rid of all added sugar. And you chat with others in the well registry who are doing it, and you share your stories. And it's all self-report, and it's all self-motivated. But what, this is the idea, is we want to reach out to this group of citizen scientists interested in wellness, interested in thriving, interested in answering some of the complicated questions about how do you, how do you follow these optimal 
lifestyle behaviors. What are they and how do you follow them? So I did it. I got all my topics in in 45 minutes. I think the directors were freaked out when I saw how many topics I had. That wasn't rushed, right? And then if you can't think of any questions, I thought I would just load the dice. <laughs> and, and again, really what I try to do is sort of give you nutrition questions and food questions. And I'm open to either. And our first one's it, right here. I have a nutritional question. On the GMO, you talked about labeling. Could, could you put to bed the issue about whether GMO foods have any nutritional uh, problems associated with them or not? Because they are banned in Europe, for example for maybe reasons which are not yep. valid. So, well, I, I don't think I can put it to bed forever. The problem is it's a natural experiment with no real control group. We've, we are all exposed now. So there is the possibility. So technically, let's get into one other detail. To be genetically modified, you have to put a different species genome into the thing that you're growing. OK, so do you know what's in the nutritional golden rice in the Philippines? What do you think? Is it fish? Is it frog? Dandelion. Are you worried? So one of the issues with the GMO might be that we're inserting the DNA of another species, and something's going to eat that, and they're going to die off, and something that used that as a food source. And so we don't know. There are potential unintended consequences. So you're going to have to weigh the potential unintended consequences, of which there are none yet, with the possible benefit of more nutrition, more yield. But in fact, there probably isn't more yield yet meaningfully. So I can't put it to bed right now. There aren't any that I know of known adverse effects. And it's going to be a really hard one to study. So more, I, I'm just more interested in you being aware of the many different issues that go into it. It's not just that another species genome is inserted into part of the food they want to grow for you. Yes? Do you have any like advice for like athletes or bodybuilders on like what foods we should eat more of or like what foods specifically we should avoid? So I do this. You should take my human nutrition class. Are you a student or no? No, I'm a high schooler. Okay, high schooler. So what we, uh, I'm going to give you a link. I'm not a sports nutritionist. There's a guy named John Berardi who's a pretty sensible sports nutritionist. I also, as my teaching assistant, had a Stanford football player who eats 6,000 calories a day for his practices. He gets 300 grams of protein a day. So we had this protein debate on and on and on and on. And he doesn't try. He doesn't have protein powders. He doesn't have protein bars. He just eats food. <laughs> and he's fine. In fact, eating 6,000 calories a day takes a huge amount of time. <laughs> so my advice for athletes is the more protein you eat, the more you're cutting back on carbs. And the carbs is what you need for fueling your energy. So I would just say just eat more of it and eat more of a balanced diet of a variety of foods. And you're probably going to be OK. As for optimizing it, you need to go to a sports nutritionist, not me, because it's not my specialty. Uh, I have a question. What are your thoughts on the supplements? On the supplements, yeah. yeah. Do you recommend supplements daily? Or if you don't, what should we do to yeah. supplement that? Yeah, quick one there. So uh, if you live in the greater Palo Alto area and eat a varied diet, there's really no evidence that the supplement is going to help you. Um, I know people who don't get enough. I know stages of life where they don't get enough. Enough. My little nine-year-old is a pain in the butt right now. He wakes up. He will not eat breakfast. He's like living on air. I don't know how he's doing it. And med students, God, I think there's some med students who should seriously be taking supplements right now because they're working 24-hour shifts, and they're just getting stuff out of the vending machine. So I'd say there's phases in life, which is important. And there's populations who don't have access to a varied diet. And they could use that. The general population who has access to a varied diet doesn't need it for basic nutrients, not even a multivitamin, multimineral. On the other hand, those at least are pretty safe. And those are usually in doses that are close to the RDA. So if you really want to hedge your bets, a multivitamin, <laughs> multimineral. But the studies we have on the people who have done that, it hasn't really been a benefit. So I'm not a big fan of supplements, unless it's a time of life, a type of person or a group who doesn't have access to food, and then it is. Then it is reasonable. For those of you raising your hand, the way it works is you have to get a mic, and there's mics. So don't look at me. Look at the women with the mics, and then you'll be more likely of getting a question in. Uh, question, Dr. Gardner. Um, I, vehement, I vehemently disagree with your statement on GMOs. Um, I Please. Just, yeah, I, I think you know Monsanto is well documented for their use of Agent Orange. Roundup, which is a chemical, 
DDTs, we all know what those chemicals mean. Um, and when you ingest that stuff, I don't think it's good. That's not my question, though. Okay. That's just my personal opinion about the chemicals that, that Monsanto makes. My question is in regards to eggs, dairy, ah. cheese. Uh, what is your professional opinion on the intake of cheese and dairy uh, from a nutritional and cellular point of view? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Can I do the first one? I don't have a position for or against GMOs. I'm just saying it's more nuanced than you think. I'm really not in favor of Monsanto at all. I am totally against Monsanto. What's the nuance? But it's a really complex issue, GMO. It's not just that there's an evil company making it. There's different things going on. The, the coolest new thing is actually an Arctic crisp apple that they want to make because it won't go brown after you've cut it. But let's not go there. Let's do eggs, cheese, and dairy. That's an important thing. The majority of the population is lactose intolerant, and they do fine without dairy. I could stop right there. There's isn't, isn't dairy full of uh, you know, sugars, like cheeses and things? No, dairy doesn't have much sugar at all. No sugar. So no. milk, uh, well, milk has lactose. You're lactose intolerant. Are you, fam are you familiar with Dr. Neil Bernard's studies on cheese? Yeah, Neil Bernard is a serious right. uh, uber low fat vegan proponent who I have to say doesn't cook. I'm a little upset with Neil. I sat with him at dinner the other day and I really like a lot of what he says. And so I thought, cool, so what's your favorite thing to cook? And he said, well, I, I don't really cook. <laughs> and I said, Neil, you're this super vegan low fat maniac. You must be cooking tasty foods for yourself. Not really, I order out a lot. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I just lost some faith right there. So I am usually vegan, and I cook a lot, and I go to the farmer's market a lot. OK, sorry. And cheese, eggs, and dairy. Uh, I have chickens in my backyard, so I eat some eggs uh, that I know were raised properly. I'm more of an ethical dairy avoider than a nutritional dairy avoider. So dairy, uh, you know, all the stuff that we're putting in dairy, the antibiotics in the cows, et cetera, Again, makes it a complicated issue. It's not simple. What about raw milk that got grown in organic pastures? Is that the same? <gasps> We'd be here all day. So dairy's complicated. So one simple answer is lactose intolerant people who avoid it do fine. So you don't need it, but it could be OK. Tough one. OK, so this actually plays into that. My daughter is a very, very strict vegan. Uh -huh. And she tells me all the time, don't drink milk, except my doctors say, do drink milk. Um, you know, for bone density, et cetera. Uh -huh. So who do I listen to? So, uh, <laughs> and is she advising you or her? She's advising you? Right, so here's a, <laughs> so here's an interesting twist on that. So it's absolutely true that dairy is in America, especially for women, one of the main sources of calcium. Calcium is protective of osteoporosis. There are populations all over the world that are lactose intolerant who have osteoporosis rates lower than ours. And they get no dairy. They also don't live as long as we do to maybe have the hip fractures that we have. And they also get way more physical activity. And the biggest protector of bone health is actually weight bearing. It's actually true that the Americans who are the heaviest and overweight have less osteoporosis because the weight bearing has challenged their system to respond and make stronger bones. Not that I'm pushing that as a reason to be overweight. <laughs> but the thing, OK, so here's a question for you. If American women won't be more active, should they then eat dairy? Because you could say, you don't have to eat dairy, just be more active. And they don't. They take the elevator to the health club. You know, <laughs> There's the health club, but I wouldn't want to walk up the stairs, so I think I'll take the elevator. So that cracks me up sometimes. So maybe American women uh, would benefit from dairy f for that reason, but maybe they could just be more physically active, but we can't make them. Yes? Um, are there any benefits to intermittent fasting? Oh, uh, intermittent fasting. Yeah. That's a fabulous question. So I actually have the honor of working with a postdoctoral research fellow who just published one of the first studies in JAMA Internal Medicine, and they compared just cutting back on calories to cutting back on calories the same amount with intermittent fasting. And there is no difference between the two. So I have the personal advantage of talking to him. And what's frustrating is to lose weight uh, with enough people to be scientifically valid, you need a lot of people over a large amount of time. And unless you follow everybody around with a camera, you can't be sure they really did it. So some of the reviewers 
criticisms were, how do you know the people that said they were doing intermittent fasting weren't just doing what the other folks were doing? Because they had the same effect. So in the one study that I've seen that's published, and it was a better study than most, it was the same as just cutting back on calories. Now, that's the average. I have to say I'm a huge proponent for looking into some things work for some people and others don't. And so what if intermittent fasting for one person is the way they're able to control things and make it work? And for others, it's just, no, I'm just going to cut back on this many calories a day. So I'm not willing to dismiss it. Um, but I, I haven't seen any evidence that, ah, if we only knew that, it would have worked and we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic. Back here. Is the organic dairy better than non-organic anyway? OK, so is organic dairy better than non-organic dairy? Uh, you'd really have to look into the practices, because there's a minimum way to get labeled as organic. And you can get by with the minimum. And there, there could be somebody who's not certified as organic, and they meet all and exceed the guidelines, but they're not certified, and so it's not labeled. So it's a very hard question to answer, unless you made everything else the same. So nutritionally, I don't think it's that much better. Environmentally, if you do follow all the guidelines for organic, it's more environmentally oriented than health oriented, in my mind. Hi. Um, I was a vegetarian for about 10 years. Um, then I wasn't, and then I tried to go back, and I started gaining weight. Now I go to Jumpstart MD, which is ah, started by Stanford. Yeah. Students, I don't know that you'd agree with some of it's l it's less carbs. It's not no carbs. It's less carbs, uh -huh. less fat, less sugar, way more protein. Um, but there is cheese, and so I eat a lot of cheese and meat now. But I still love meatless products. And so when you go to the grocery store and you buy meatless products, I don't know what is best for you uh. when it comes to, like, Morningstar versus tofu versus... Yeah. Because um, I like all of those. So are there any recommendations for meatless products? Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's, I'm not going to be able to do it in a minute and do it justice so we could talk afterwards. So we now have uh, Impossible Meat. We have Memphis Meat. We have Beyond Meat. Uh, we had all these other. So one of them is a set of all plant things that look and taste like meat, but they're all plants. Memphis Meat is actually animal tissue grown in a Petri dish, so it was never an animal. And it actually bleeds, but it's not. So we have a lot of meat replacers. Uh, I'm not a fan of meat replacers. I just don't miss meat. But there are people who are. And I don't want to be condescending or proselytizing. So I think a lot of the Morningstar type things you're thinking of, those are transition products. Or maybe not even transition. That's as far as they're going to get. They really wanted something like a sausage. They really wanted something like a burger. And they found one. And they don't all taste the same. Some of them are pretty awful. And some of them. They nailed it. They've got herbs and spices and things like that. So I actually think in the, in the world, there's a lot more ex-vegetarians than vegetarians. And my hope is when they went vegetarian and went back, they didn't go all the way back. They found some balance in the middle where they were able to cut back on the amount, not only of animal products, but of junk food. And they're just more sensitive to all the stuff that they're eating. So I'm just hoping it leads to a greater awareness of what you're eating in general. I probably have time for one or two questions. How, how did? seedless oranges come to be? How did seedless watermelon come to be? And why can't I find yellow corn on the cob anymore? Oh, OK. So, and I can't answer either of them, but they are fabulous <laughs> questions. So yeah, if you get a seedless watermelon, how do you grow watermelon again? It'll all be gone. So I definitely don't have an answer to that. I, no, I don't think so. I don't think watermelon's GMO. Yeah, not GMO, hybrid. And we've been cross-pollinating things forever. So don't give it the GMO taint. Um, I will say for the yellow corn, I'm frustrated too. And I don't know if you see what I see. The white corn is advertised for being sweeter. Yeah. The American palate is just stuck on sweet. And I want <laughs> yellow corn. The other day, all I could find was mixed yellow-white kernels. I couldn't find yellow. The other thing, just for fun, is corn a vegetable or a grain? I just looked it up the other day. If you eat corn on the cob, it's a vegetable. And if you take it off the cob, it's a grain, technically. <laughs> Fun fact. OK, sorry. Not very helpful. Last one. Am I done? <laughs> one more. This is it. Uh, throw me a softball, please. Can I answer this? Can you talk about the ketogenic diet? Is that good or bad? What's that? The which one? The ketogenic. The ketogenic diet. So I am really fascinated. So there's a group in San Francisco now called Verda. 
They're working specifically with diabetics, specifically type 2 diabetics. And the ketogenic diet means taking your carbs down to about 20 grams a day, which really does mean eliminating grains and beans and fruit completely and having a few vegetables here and there. And so they have some really interesting pilot data of getting people off their meds and getting their glucose totally under control. In a diabetic population, and the problem with diabetes is putting away your carbs. It's putting away the glucose. I, had, uh, I assigned my students. Uh, I actually saw two TED Talks, one by the woman proposing the ketogenic diet. And where's my uh, Neil Bernard fan? I had the other Neil Bernard, two TED Talks, head to head. And Neil said, I've cured diabetes with a vegan diet. And Sarah Hallberg said, I've cured diabetes with a ketogenic diet. And I had the students rate them. They thought they were both not all that compelling. And then I had them both try to come up with a diet and tell me what it looked like. And they had a really hard time coming up with a, di a ketogenic diet that looked like they could eat it because so much <laughs> food was gone. So uh, it's an interesting concept. It helps cure epilepsy, epileptic seizures in kids, so there is a place for it in the medical community. This absence of carbs, it's not a very fun-looking diet. No grains, no beans, no fruits. No. So it's an interesting concept, and I'm actually hoping to study it myself later. You guys have been great. Is there anything else I have to say to quit? Thank you. Thank you, Christopher Gardner. Help us thank him.